Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is gonna be on propagation, how I like to propagate, what methods I like. So this is not going to be like a super structured video and like a definitive how to <laughs> propagate because I'm not that person to teach you all of those things. I put out a question on Instagram asking people if there was anything they wanted me to talk about regarding propagation. Um, and a few came in, but um, I haven't had that question up for very long. So what I think I'll do is I'll make this kind of like this casual series. We'll propagate plants together. Um, I'll talk about my experiences with different plants, what I like to do, the successes, the failures. And I think that could be like a pretty easy series to keep going and might be pretty fun. Yeah, so I, what I wanted to do today is um, there are two plants that I wanted to cut. They're both philodendrons, unfortunately, um, and I know some people are interested in anthurium and like Hoya propagation, but today I have two anthuriums, uh, sorry, two philodendrons that do need a chop. The first one I mentioned in my plant tour video, and that is this philodendron gloriosum. So this was like my very, very first, was it my first? Yeah, it was my first gloriosum ever. And I've chopped it quite a few times and shattered it around, um, and it's time for a chop again because as you can see, this pot is like already oval shaped. It's trying to bust out of here. Yeah, this one needs a chop. I, I want to grow these two newer leaves separately because I had moved it to higher light and it grew shorter petioles, which is exactly what I wanted for this plant. I want it to be a little bit more compact and bushy. And then these other long petiole guys, I'm going to chop and grow separately and share those around. Maybe I'll sell one or two. So that's the plan for this one. It's gonna be a pretty easy one to, to propagate. And then the other one is my Philodendron Majestic. Also a super easy one. Um, this one was the one I had moved from my Mills Bow was much higher light into my exo back here way farther away from the light and the previous leaves that were really really bleached in the mills bow um, I want to you know restart the plant so I'm going to grow this leaf on its own this is the newest leaf that unfurled inside the exo and it's much nicer so I have no aerial roots on this one but uh, the Majestics are pretty easy going, so I'm okay with growing this back out from nothing. And it's okay if it reverts a little bit to a smaller leaf size, so yeah. And then there was one more plant I wanted to cut. I'm just gonna go grab it. So this is the Gloriosum that I mentioned in my plant tour video. It was already root bound at that point, but now... <laughs> um, it has completely busted out of this cup and this is so packed full of roots like like it is a brick and i wanted to wait until this leaf was fully unfurled but the more that this splits open um and the stem is like growing out of it i'm concerned that it's going to kind of scrape itself this is just stressing me out so as much as um i wanted to wait i thought it can probably survive the chop and still unfurl this leaf just fine. So yeah, that's what we're gonna do, those three plants, and I'm going to be answering questions while I do that. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to talk about, which is just exciting for me because I keep thinking about it. So I've been mentioning that myself, Charmaine, Jing, and Aaron are wanting to import this year, so we just actually put in our wish list or like our, our plant request list to Equiflora this afternoon and he um, responded immediately with confirmation of those plants and we actually got everything we asked for which is super super exciting and that's always like the anxiety part of it so uh, Charmaine and I were talking about maybe doing like a collab video about like importing and unboxing because that's the super fun part too and just like how we clean up our imports and then set them up to acclimate so yeah, I just wanted to go through like the plants that I'm expecting to be getting. Um, this I think will be in late March or early April. My import list these days are way, way more simple and way less plant than it used to be. Like I used to get in like tons of different species. I'm just not that interested in so many plants anymore. I have just, let me see, 
two plants here that I don't currently own and then two that I already do own. So what I'm getting is um, one Anthurium CF Bessier or Bessier AF. So I actually don't own it but the price has dropped so much on this one that I think now is the great time to be getting one. I think they're really beautiful like with the way that the lobes kind of like curve in with that little cute little sinus. Um, I've been wanting one for quite a long time, so yeah, I'm glad I'm going to be getting one. So really quick thing as well, like, um, so a lot of people are getting the Bessier AF from Ecuador, but they're just like dropping the AF on the name. I, I guess this is just a little PSA that like Bessier is a completely different plant to Bessier AF, and it actually looks quite different. I'm going to throw up a photo right now of what the Bessier actually looks like. So it's like, just the leaf itself resembles maybe like a crystal mag or something or some sort of magnificent hybrid a lot but the really kind of distinct characteristic on the Bessier is like that wavy undulating leaf margin even as like a juvenile plant it does have those waves from the couple of juvenile plants that I have seen the sinus is quite shallow and the lobes are quite short so it's like pretty flat on top so it's like nothing like the Bessier AF well I guess to like a non-plant person, they look the same, but like to a plant person, they don't really look anything alike. So, little PSA. And then the second plant I got is um, another Gloriosum because I can't help myself. So I'll be adding another Gloriosum to the family. Uh, I haven't sold a Gloriosum. I sold one over winter, but like I keep cutting and <laughs> reproducing them, and I don't know what I'm gonna do with them because. I want to grow them all in my tent and my tent is like jam-packed now so um, that's a problem for spring me um, and then the third plant I got was a philodendron linamii and I said that I wasn't gonna get one but the price dropped quite a lot so I like the plant don't get me wrong but I wasn't willing to pay like what they were asking last year which was like when they released it, I think at one point it was 650 US which when you factor in like the the shipping costs, the PayPal fee, and like paperwork and everything, we're closing in on like a thousand dollars Canadian, and there was no way I was paying that. So even when it dropped down to two fifty, I wasn't willing to pay that. But now it's at ninety dollars, and that is like really good. Well, I mean, I guess like in the grand scheme of things, it's not really good, but it's a reasonable price for me. So. I jumped on that and then the last plant that I got two of, so those other plants I got only one of. Um, normally I am kind of in, I'm kind of subscribed to the idea that you buy two of each plant as insurance but when they're at a certain price like I can't really, it, I can't really justify spending the money on two, especially when it's coming in in a March, April, springtime. It's not going to be super cold. So yeah, I, I didn't go for doubles except for this one plant, which I got double of because I want to hoard it. And that's Philodendron SP Columbia. So I mentioned in my very first video, my plant favorites video, I was showing my SP Silver from uh, also Gilberto. So I, I have read from actual botanists that these SP Columbia and SP Silver are the same species and I obviously believe them um, and you know seeing ones that are like kind of more green than the others or like some are more narrow some are more like wide and pillowy that must just be natural variation within the species um, and I think the ones that I saw a lot in Asia were the more green ones and that's the one I wanted and I think that uh, Gilberto actually has the green knee type, I hope. So I got two of those. So that's uh, two, three, five plants I'm getting in the spring. Really super excited. Um, it does mean that I will have to like get going on selling a lot of plants because A, I have to pay for these and B, I don't have the space to keep all these plants so I'm just gonna like get rid of the plants that you know not aren't really aren't really doing anything for me and then just bring in the plants that I know I'll love and these plants I know I will love so anyway um we're gonna get started on which one plant should I do first I think I'll do the gloriosum first yeah I'll do the gloriosum first so let me see okay I did get a few questions about growth points, spent nodes, and things like that. 
Oh my goodness, I totally forgot to mention. Um, this shirt is from Charmaine. So if you've probably seen it on her, this is Tales of the Thrift. She designed this. I was a scaredy hat kid, so I didn't watch that show, but I love this shirt. It is so cute. As far as I know, I think Charmaine wants to kind of like redo this design slightly and then get it reprinted. So, you know, obviously she's going to be announcing it on her channel when that happens, but yeah. All right, so let's get started on the questions. So I got a few questions on um, spent nodes, growth points, kind of that general theme of things. So the question was like, what the heck is a spent node? I don't know why I don't fully understand this. So um, a spent node doesn't exist on every genus of plant. So if we're talking about aeroids, which is basically all I'm talking about right now, um, if we're talking about aeroids, Spent nodes do exist, and the ones that we're most commonly cutting are philodendrons and monstera. Like I've seen, you know, a lot of sad stories on Facebook where someone was sold a spent node and didn't know that they got one, and then they were like six months later asking for help on like why their propagation is not growing, and then um, they told them it's a spent node. So I'm just gonna quickly talk about what a spent node is and there are like so many infographic infographics on Facebook that that explain this really really well if I can find one I'll throw one up but I don't know if I'll have like it'll be okay for me to just put that up here I'm not sure if I can find like the original uh, creator of that infographic to credit so if I can't then I won't put it up but anyways let's just use philodendron as an example so every node will create the, will be an apical bud, which is like, so on this plant, for example, this newest leaf is right here. If I feel back the caterpillar, this is the newest caterpillar right here. And that's the apical bud, meaning like this is the tip, the top growth of the plant. And that's where a lot of the growth hormones are concentrated. So, Unless you stress the plant in somehow, or unless it's like a philodendron burly marks, it's not going to activate lower down growth points just on its own. Um, now, every node has a second growth point that can produce growth if the plant gets chopped or if the apical bud dies, and that is called uh, an axillary bud. So here is one on the plant here. The axillary bud is right here, that little bump here. I don't even know if that focused, because once again, I don't have a viewfinder. Um, so if you stress the plant and you cut it, then that will activate a lower down axillary bud. It might not be the one, the next lower down, it might be lower down than that. It might suddenly activate more than one, because that's pretty common too. So, so let's say I cut this node here with this axillary bud, and I cut right here and isolated that node, and then this grew out another leaf, and then I chopped that off, then this original node is now spent, because it's already used up its axillary bud. I hope I'm making sense. It's not impossible for new growth to come out of that once you cut off the new growth, and I'll explain why. Um, I have another plant here to demonstrate. This is my Monstera Escaletto. Um, this was a single node propagation. It was just like a wet stick with, oh no, it wasn't wet stick, it had roots. It was a rooted node. So this one, pushed out from its axillary bud here another leaf. And you'll probably notice this on philodendrons and um, monstera. I'm trying to get comfortable. Um, the first thing that pops out almost seems like just a sheath with no, no leaf and then a leaf comes out of it. So you can see that this leaf came out of this sheath and this sheath actually has like basically like almost like a pseudo leaf at the end of it and that's called a profil. On other plants it can be like something that actually resembles a leaf but sometimes it's just like this little like nubbin little 
baby spoon looking thing um, and that actually is the profil so that profil will actually have a node attached to it with an axillary bud for the most part so now if I if this leaf grew out more and I chopped that off there is a chance I might still have the node from the profil attached to the main stem and that wouldn't be a spent node I hope that's making sense because I've, I've cut a a uh, monstera before when the new growth like it was an elbow and the new growth came out green so I chopped the green off um, and there was a very very small amount of stem of new stem attached to the axillary bud and that pushed out more growth but that's not to say it can always happen so yeah I hope I hope that explained spent nodes um, if you know if you want more info on that or like clarification if you want like ID on like whether you have a spent node on a plant or not like it's always a good idea to put it on Facebook but I know like sometimes like people can be mean on Facebook and like laugh at people and which is being like a so you know you can always message me or your like plant friends that you trust it's always worth getting more than one opinion on whether you're plant has a spent node or not. And then the um, other question kind of regarding growth points was, can a single node, e.g. Monstera Albo, produce more than one growth point? Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I kind of covered that with the Escaletto, but let's say you had an Albo and then you just cut off a wet stick and that's all you have. That wet stick is gonna have one axillary bud. And once that axillary bud grows, that stick itself is not going to activate anything else. That's done. It's 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 spent. But like I said, like the the new growth, once it has its first leaf, that might actually that new growth might already contain two nodes. If that makes sense. I don't know if I'm making sense. <laughs> it's almost my bedtime. All right. So um, if I want to keep, I want to keep this like really compact bit at the front so I'm going to cut off the front two leaves right here where are my shears dang it where are my shears ah. okay so whenever I'm cutting a plant I always look for the axillary bud and make sure I don't cut through that because that would be a shame so there's one for this new leaf it's right here the node is here so I'm gonna cut behind it and when I'm cutting um, a cutting like this it doesn't matter actually so much for a crawler but for an, a climber like let's say it's growing like this you want to cut it the bottom part of the cutting quite far from the node so you have room for rot insurance so if it starts to creep up the rot starts to creep up here you can still cut back without cutting into the node um, and then the next one below it this would be the top of that cutting and that would be the one exposed to airflow so you wouldn't be super concerned about rot for that one um, but for a crawler it doesn't really matter so much so like I said the axillary bud is here so I'm gonna cut below it there just above, uh, just in front of the petiole of the previous leaf. So not a ton of roots on this one, but it's okay. This is the cutting. These cutie little leaves. So I'm going to just callus this and before I just leave it to dry, I'm going to apply some rooting hormone to it. So I don't have one that I like really swear by. This is the only one I've ever used and that's like the Promix, the Promix Stim Root one. This one actually I don't believe has antifungal properties. Um, so the next one that I buy, I definitely want to use one with antifungal. I don't have like a handy little container like Charmaine because I'm not as organized as her. So I'm just, I just got some in my hand and I'm going to dip that in here and hopefully that will encourage it to root. I don't know how well this works, but I use it anyway because at least this powder also helps dry out the wound at the end. Where do I put this? <laughs> 
So that's going to cal as I'll put this on top of my XO. All right, now I'm going to cut another, I'm just gonna, you know what, I'm gonna cut this into single nodes. This is not a pretty plant on its own. Do, do, do. Making sure I don't hit the auxiliary buzz, so that auxiliary bud is here. I'm gonna cut here. Ah! There's one cutting. These roots actually look really dry. I am concerned. And one right here. Right in between here. All right, three gloriosum cuttings. One, two, and three. Some rooting hormone. And like I said, for um, for crawlers, I'm not that concerned with rot because the stem stays above the substrate. Okay, we're done with that one. All right, first plant is done. Let's do the majestic next because that's not going to make a mess. Okay, all right, here we go. And then I'm gonna just pull up another question. So let's do, let's do myco. So there is a question about myco. I am planning to do a video on myco, but I do wanna do more research because I'm not that comfortable putting a video out there unless I feel like I know a lot more. And I know I won't, like nobody really knows everything there is to know about myco because, you know, fungi in general is just this like vast and fascinating world. But I do wanna do a bit more research on that before um, I put out a video. But the question was um, like, what's my experience like? with myco so uh, I think I think I started using myco maybe a year and uh, year ago I think and I don't remember why I decided to look into it but the more I looked into it the more it was like a no-brainer to try it because it's just like this ancient symbiotic relationship that works so well in nature and why wouldn't it work well for your plants so like if I want to just put my experience down into a nutshell it is that um, I find root growth really robust with myco and I find that it has woken up plants that were otherwise dormant and if I want to say one genus of plant that it really works well on for me is anthuriums um, I think of all my plants, my anthuriums are probably my heaviest feeders. I believe that myco is helping them uptake the, that fertilizer a lot better. Um, so case in point, I had this one hybrid. I think it was maybe like a mag pappy hybrid. It's, it's an un unknown hybrid anyway. So I, Charmaine has that plant now. That plant for me, I bought it locally with a single leaf and then it put out one leaf I think in my care and then every growth from that point onwards would just like kind of a leaf would emerge and then it would shrivel off and die and then a leaf and another leaf would emerge and it would shrivel off and die and it did that about five times um, and I I knew it was like a feed thing it was hungry and it couldn't sustain new growth at that point I think I was feeding it Schultz and Calmag and those are pretty potent uh, feeds so I wasn't sure what to do and when I discovered myco I applied it to that plant so I literally just took it out exposed the roots put a bunch of myco over it and then plunked that back into the soil it was in and then it immediately put out growth and it sustained that growth and it grew a bunch of cute little mushrooms I don't know if that's like any in any way related to the micro but it was growing mushrooms a lot so then I uh, sold that plant to Charmaine so she's had it and it hadn't grown for a while either but then I think it just recently put out another leaf and it did sustain that. Um, and the nice thing about Myco is that like it, you use a little bit and then obviously it's going to multiply so you don't need to like keep reapplying unless you're for some reason killing off the Myco with like systemic or antifungal treatments. So yeah I don't want to go too deep into Myco. Um, 
because there's just like way too much to talk about but I will say that like let's just talk about it how like how I would use it with this one so if I'm propagating a plant and it has roots I would use myco on it to help establish those roots quicker but let's say for example this plant I'm cutting off this top leaf here so I'm just gonna do that really quick so this tippy leaf here, I'm gonna cut below the node here. Um, there's tons of stem to work with, so I'm gonna cut it like quite low down, about, can you see? I can't really see my viewfinder. Right there. This is the leaf that I'm left with. This leaf has no roots, and Michael would be useless on this, until it had active root growth because myco depends on plant roots to attach to or like form this symbiotic relationship with so i've seen like a couple people asking like oh can i put it on this like rootless chunk um and the answer is like yeah you can but it's kind of kind of pointless yeah don't do it um until it has roots or like air layer the plant get it to develop roots and then cut it so this plant here is not going to need micro. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pot it up into a little um, cup with my preferred substrate in. Actually, I forgot to get a cup, so I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I have two cup options. I have this one and this one I got from Charmaine. These are just like disposable dessert cups, you know, like for catering. <laughs> Uh, no, this is too small. Okay, I'm gonna use this cup here. So typically, I will callus the stem for at least a few hours, if not overnight. And that is what I'm gonna do, but just for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna just show you what I do with the substrate. Um, so I talk a lot about like my little pond mix. It's not my pond mix, but it's a pond mix that I use quite a lot. Um, and that is roughly equal parts of the choose upon perlite and the orchid like the smaller grade orchiata i think it's called classic um and it's just roughly equal parts and by that i mean i measure like by scoop like two scoops of this two scoops of that you know and so on so that's what i really like using and the reason why i started using this mix in the first place was because i hated uh pawn and how quickly it dried up and also like how heavy and dense it was so like some plants needed an airier substrate and I just couldn't keep up with the watering for pond so um, I started adding in perlite and I felt quite like that I was also adding in Lekka um, and then Jing and I went and split a big giant bag of Orchiata because um, there was this uh, one guy growing Hoyas that mixed Orchiata into his like homemade pond mix and it was a really nice addition because Orchiata is really good at like retaining nutrients and like, kind of releasing it back into the substrate. So I thought that was cool and also it provided more chunk to the mix so I'm just going to show you this right here. The pond part particles are the smallest, and then the next biggest on average is the perlite, and the orchiata is the biggest. And this just gives a little bit more aeration to the substrate, and I find it works a lot better, and wood is a little bit more water retentive than the rocks that's in pond. So I've been really, really liking this, and I really like this for propagating too, because as a long-term growing medium, it works quite well, so yeah. That's what I would do. I would just put in a little reservoir. If I was gonna use myco on this plant, which I'm not this time, because there's no roots, um, I would add my water reservoir at this point. So I'd have a little bit of water in here. No feed, just water. Um, and then place in the plant, put myco on and then cover it with substrate. So that just prevents me 
adding water right after adding myco and then just washing that all that myco into the reservoir because myco does need oxygen to be able to to survive so you can grow plants in semi-hydro using myco but that myco needs to have access to oxygen they, they, they can't grow anaerobically so you can't do use micro in like full hydroponics only in passive hydro and that is a question I get quite often too so like I'm just gonna finish potting this up so you know what it would look like at the end so that would be the leaf done it would the stem probably goes down to about there and then I would leave the reservoir just down here and I'll just wait for roots to form and that's about it so yeah that's that's the plant that's how I would propagate in semi-hydro I really highly recommend this mix though because it's just good for long-term growing and like it's kind of dark so you don't really see algae so much like that's one thing I don't like as much about propagating in perlite is that it gets so dirty so fast and especially if you're using any sort of feed that has um, color to it like for example liquid dirt or like if you're using kelp feed or marfil or something like that it starts to look really icky pretty fast I do need to restock on orchiatum perlite though and I think there's like a global perlite shortage okay one other question I got was um, it's cute what is the most surprising propagation growth you've had I had to kind of really think about this one and I probably will remember one later but I wanted to think of plants that I still currently had in my possession. The first one I actually thought about was um, this variegated ZZ that I propagated from leaf. So I got this like half moon leaf cutting. Locally, it was a $5 little cutting and it was just like a leaf that popped off her plant. It had a little bit of petiole on it. So here's a process that I went through with this propagation and this actually took me about a year and a half before this popped out and that was like the biggest gasp I've ever let out in my life was when this came out when I like I didn't I just ignore this for the most part and I add water to it every three to four weeks or something like that so in the beginning I had a leaf um, I kept that I think in this exact cup with just water. I just like refilled that water every now and then and eventually that petiole kind of swole up into like kind of like a Not even a ball. It was just like a little bit swollen And then where did I do from that point? I put it in perlite I think and I was growing it that way and then one day I took it out and it had grown a full tuber with roots coming off of it and at that point I transferred it to pond and it stayed in that pond for a really long time and then this popped out and it's it's all white so I don't know if like it's gonna continue to grow all white I really hope not but honestly that was the most surprising propagation because I know it can be done I just didn't think that it would happen because <laughs> it was a year and a half of doing nothing so if you are propagating ZZ from leaf as long as it is like developing a tuber it's gonna work it's just like depends on how patient you're gonna be and for me it's like I didn't have to do much with it, it just I just couldn't let it completely dry out for a very very long time and yeah it didn't I didn't really bother me but it was kind of frustrating I guess every now and then to look at it and be like I should just get rid of it but you know once this popped out I I don't even really like variegated ZZs that much but now it's like so precious to me yeah so one of the most surprising and then the other one also wasn't like super surprising um, but it was risky so in my plant tour again I talked about this plant um, it was my beautiful pappy hybrid super dark gorgeous one of my most favorite plants in my collection so it had stem rot the trouble with the stem rot is that you know like often the stem like so like this is the stem oftentimes it will start like you know one end or the other and just like creep up the stem but on this one it was actually rotting from that like side in so it was rotting like this like that and so what I ended up having to do was like take my little scraper and like really like scrape away all the 
all the raw off the sides. Essentially what I was doing was slicing the plant vertically, like that was the effect of it. And you can see, I hope you can see actually, this is where I sliced off. So if I turn it a little bit, you can see that it's, can you, I really can't tell if you can see. So this, this is where I sliced off and like scraped off all the rot. And then the other half is where the green is. So the stem used to be like maybe a third bigger than what it currently is right now. I guess like I really wasn't banking on this surviving, but um, we have an activated growth point. There's a little red bump right here and it's growing every day. So it is actually growing and I guess this is one thing actually too really interesting about anthuriums is that you can like slice them vertically down the stem. Like if you had like a more mature plant with like a thick stem and it had like all these leaves, you could get away with like slicing it down the middle and separating it in half like that. You gotta be pretty brave to do that. And I think Kunzo has a video on his Instagram or like a reel or something of him doing that. It makes me nervous to watch, but he's like so cute and he's just like, yeah, there we go. Um, anyway, yeah, so you couldn't do that with like a philodendron. Like you couldn't slice this down the center and then expect something to grow um, out of both sides. It's just not gonna happen, but anthuriums can. I don't know if I would ever do that intentionally without it being like a last resort, you know, save the plant kind of, kind of situation. But yeah, this was, you know, surprising, a pleasant surprise. Um, one question, I don't have actually the stuff with me. No, I don't. Okay, uh, I'll just throw out pictures of what I'm using right now. So the question is, um, what products do you use to eradicate thrips and application type? Thrips. Um, I am very, very fortunate in that I don't live in a thrippy place. I've only ever had thrips once. I want to say, and that was when um, thrips arrived in uh, Equiflora order. So a lot of people got thrips off of like mainly I think it was the big philodendrons like Pastazanum or like Plamanii Mame, those ones, they all had thrips and they all kind of like hatched and emerged a few weeks after arriving. So like Fido wasn't going to catch that, it wasn't even adult thrips. So. Actually, no, there were some adult thrips on my plant. They just like appeared out of nowhere. They weren't there when I first caught them. But anyway, that was the only time I ever got thrips, but I'm not actually super concerned about thrips. A, because I don't really get them that often, and B, because I use systemic. So before using systemic, I was using Dr. Doom, and that's what I use quite heavily on the that import that was thrippy. Um, and that has worked really great. I also use Spinosad. Um, and I will throw up a picture and link the exact one that I use. Um, so I use that as a foliar spray. Um, I have it mixed here and then um, when I get an import, I'll spray everything down with this. And this works really great. Um, I will say when I got thrips with the Equifloral Order, um, I used this, I got this in after I had already found the thrips. Um, and so this was kind of like the final treatment of it and then I never saw them again. Um, so spinosad worked really great for me. Um, and in the substrate I use, um, oh god, what was it called? Oh yeah. Okay, so I don't know how to pronounce this. Amida clopred? Uh, but I use that, it is, it comes in a liquid form and I dilute that into water. It's like, it's the tiniest, tiniest amount that goes into water, like a drop per liter something like that. Well, it's like I calculated how many mils and it's essentially like one or two drops in into a liter of water. And I use that as a soil drench um, every three months or so. Um, as preventative, I'll just go through and water all my plants with that. So I don't know, maybe I do get thrips and, and the systemic is working, but I just don't have a problem with thrips. And then lately, I have the least experience with this method, but I got bonide uh, systemic granules. I've been using that as preventative, so I've, I've sprinkled a little bit on the substrates of plants um, out in my living room, because those are the most susceptible to bugs. I don't know if it actually works on mealybugs, but I had some mealybugs on some of my succulents, 
and I was using it on those. Maybe it doesn't even work on mealybugs, but yeah, those are the ones that I use for thrips specifically. So for thrips specifically, I use, I swear by um, the spinosad and the imidacloprid. And Dr. Doom is really nice too, but preventatively I use imidacloprid and spinosad on new imports because I'm not having that Equiflora experience again. Like I'm not, I'm not faulting them for it. Every like thrips just happens, and like I don't see how Fido would have been able to catch that because I didn't see anything on my plants for a couple weeks before I got it. So yeah, like nothing against Equiflora, it just happens. And I'm not actually like very scared about thrips. I I guess I haven't been traumatized by thrips because it hasn't happened to me in a way that it like devastated my collection. And I know that I have the tools to combat it if it were to happen. So yeah, I think isolate the plant in um, a bin, treat it, give it like not crazy light. You know, like plants when they're very stressed, you shouldn't, like light can be a source of stress and like try not to feed it. It's not gonna, it's not gonna do anything. Um, just give it, treat it with systemic, give it like moderate light and some warmth and let the chemicals do their thing. Another question is just how damp should moss be for propagation? Um, okay, before I get on to the next plant, I'm gonna just do this question. If you're propagating in moss, I think that most people would be keeping the plant in a high humidity enclosure like a bin or a dome or a tent or something like that. So you really don't want the moss to be that soaking wet. So I have a bowl of moss here that I've just rinsed after like really soaking the dry moss because <clears throat> it does take a little bit of time for it to really like saturate the soil. I uh, sorry, this saturate the moss. I take it out in, in handfuls and just like wring it out and you shouldn't like if you were to wring your, your moss, you shouldn't see like water gushing down. Like if you if you were to squeeze it really hard, some water would come out, but it should be dry enough that it can be fluffy like this. And that's about how damp I think it should be. The wetter the moss is, the heavier it will be. So like with wetness, we're concerned about suffocating roots or um, creating like anaerobic environments for bacteria to grow. So essentially if you have it just damp enough that it, it's it's like it's saturated with water but not so wet that it's going to be heavy and compact on itself so like dry enough for it to kind of like hold this fluff and you also don't want to like compact it too much in the cup either and you also have to bear in mind that as roots grow that's going to take up space inside whatever pot or cup that you have it in so that's also going to close off gaps where air would be the more root growth you have, the more full that cup is going to be. And then um, if your moss is already quite compact to begin with, that could just be a recipe for root suffocation. So I hope that answered the question okay. Charmaine just did a IGTV video with Vandula Farms. Go check out uh, Vandula Farms and they have, um, they have Charmaine's video up there and she talks a lot more about moss. She's a lot better at explaining things than me, so go check that one out. All right, so it is time <laughs> to figure out this gloriosum. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is still so funny to me. Oh, you poor thing. Okay. This is gonna be really hard to get out because it is so like just one mass of roots. Oh my goodness, that is so solid. I'm just gonna peel it like a banana. The new growth has already pushed out really nice juicy roots though, if you can see that. Oof. Okay, let's take this out. Oh my gosh. I'm trying to remember how long 
this has stayed in here like this. This has been rooting, so it's February now. It's been rooting in here since late summer, maybe? So that would be at least six months. Still, that's pretty crazy. I don't even know where to begin. I'm just gonna time lapse this uh, root untangling. Okay, so my camera cut out in the middle of that time lapse because it overheated. So while my camera was cooling down, I finished unpacking the roots and I also put, I wrapped up the, the roots of the Gloriosum I cut earlier in wet paper towel. Actually, I, I went through the roots and just pulled off anything that was dead because um, the substrate it was in was actually like quite chunky and it was a little bit underwatered and as the stem of the Gloriosum was like stretching the pot, it was pulling the pot away from the soil. So it was, it was all, all this air around the soil and that dried out the roots even more. So there was some dead roots that I already cut off and I'm wrapping this and I'm, what I think I'm going to do is once this is callous, I'm going to stick it in water for a little bit just to see like what's actually dead and what's not and then I'll cut that and then grow that in my pond mixture. So that's the update um, of what happened while my camera was cooling down. So I just wanna show you what I uncovered. So <laughs> this is the roots that I'm working with right now. Like there is no need for this amount of roots for this size of plant. That And also like there was no way I was gonna get away with not breaking roots while taking that apart. But let's let's take a look at what's in this bowl right now. This is like not a lot of substrate. And I'm like confused because I'm sure I put more than that in the cup. Like did it eat it? I I I I just don't know. But anyway, let's let's cut this plant now. I definitely want Okay, so I definitely want to separate this little secondary growth point that activated from the rest of the plant and it's all the way down here so i think what i can do is cut about here on the plant and that would just separate out this new leaf and the new growth obviously so let's see if my shears will fit around the stem. Maybe not. I might have to use a knife for this. So I also like to use a nice a kitchen knife. I need a surface to cut on. We'll cut on top of this pot. So I want to avoid cutting that new growth point off. Also, like, this whole room smells like philodendron because when I was breaking those roots, <laughs> this, like, philodendron smell filled the room. Okay, look how pink that is. 
I've never seen such a pink stem before on a Gloriosum. It's usually white. It looks like a watermelon. Isn't that strange? So that's my new cutting. I'm gonna grow that in my pond mixture, similar to what it was before. I don't wanna get dirt on it. Get some rooting hormone on there. Now, the mother plant, I also want to cut. Let's dip that wound. Actually, you know what? I might, might not be able to cut this. This is really, really tight. And I think I've already exhausted the mother stem here. So this was from the import plant. And this is the green here is the new growth since I imported it. So I don't think there are any more auxiliary buds on this stem. But what I probably could do is cut this off and like see if anything pops out of here. I might just do that because this is like way too many roots for me to deal with right now. I don't have a container big enough. So I will, I will, where the new stem meets the old stem, I'm gonna cut right there. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Ooh. I think we got some in my tea. You know what? <laughs> So the import stem is this. All this root is there. I think, you know, it's not impossible that there's something hidden here. So I'll just put, maybe just stick that in my prop box and see if anything pops out. And then this one definitely will grow because it has this auxiliary bud here that's already activated. And, I'll just callus that overnight and pot it up tomorrow. Anyway, so it is now about 10.30. I need to be up super early tomorrow. I think my first alarm goes off at 3.45 a.m. So yeah, I'm going to cut it here, I think. Um, I, hopefully that wasn't like too boring of a video. And uh, even like as I was, um, filming more questions were coming in on Instagram of uh, propagation related so um, I'm going to tackle that at the next video of my series I will save that one question was um, about propagating Hoyas and I would love to answer that question so that's gonna be on the next video whenever that happens to be don't worry Jess I will get to you um, and yeah I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave that here. I'll put up another question box before my next video. So if you think of any questions in the meantime, um, I will definitely get to those on the next one. And for the next video, I think I, what I wanna do is I'll save any anthuriums I need to cut for that video, any Hoyas I need to cut for that video. And if you have any questions on like different growing media or different methods of propagations, please send them to me and if I it's not something I have experience with I will you know research that in the meantime maybe practice on plants because I have a lot of plants that are just growing really big and I haven't had a lot of time to propagate but if I have a reason to propagate them I would definitely do that so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna grab Huxley and we're gonna come back and say goodbye Huxley's back I really missed Huxley when he was away last week at grandpa's house do you have a nice time at Grandpa's house? Grandpa? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for sitting through this video. I hope it was a good time. And if I didn't get to your question this time, I will make sure to get to it next time. Um, and I'll, again, I'll be putting up another question box on Instagram for the next video in this series. Um, let me know what you're pro propagating these days. <laughs> Let me know what you're propagating these days. I'm always curious to know what people are propagating and it motivates me to propagate more. Like I think I mentioned before, I haven't propagated much in the last six months because I haven't been that motivated to because A, I'm super busy and B, like I'm not selling plants so much anymore. I just like, it takes so much energy to coordinate pickups and things like that. So yeah, um, I hope you have the best Sunday ever. 
really nice week and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. See, this is what happens when you are disorganized and you don't write a plan for your videos and you just go into it and wing everything. You completely forget parts of the video that you were going to mention. Allocations. Um, before filming this video, while I was waiting for my um, food delivery to arrive, uh, I unpotted my Silver Dragon because there was two plants I wanted to separate in there. And while I was doing that, I harvested a bunch of corms, so I just wanted to quickly show you how I would propagate alocasias. So, uh, you can propagate alocasias via cutting. I've just never done that. It's just a little bit too risky for me, so I prefer to do it the easy way, which is by corm. Um, so, these just kind of like fell out of the substrate. I have... There were six. Um, I have four big ones here. I, I'm giving another, I already separated that one out, but I'm giving that one to a friend. What you're looking for when you separate out a corn for an alocasia is something, actually depending on the species, they might not always look like this, but this is kind of like the bulbous size that I'm looking for. I'm looking for it to kind of like fall off easily, and bonus is if it already has growth peeking out the top like this. If you can wait to this point, that would be ideal. So what I do is, um, I actually, I'm just going to do this right now. So what I would do is put it into uh, some sort of substrate. It could be soil, it can be moss, it can be pond. Erin has done a lot of corn propagations and for her the fastest is pond. And I actually prefer to grow all my alocasias in semi-hydro anyway. So I'm going to chuck these into my pond mix. This is just like, I got this from Jing. I think she got it off Amazon. This is like just, you know, a little disposable beverage cup. I'm just gonna pop these in here one by one. I'm gonna grow them together because I don't have that much space in that many tiny pots. So I'm just gonna get, I'm just gonna get it covered up to about here. And it's going to start rooting out the side here. So I'm just going to space them out like this. And they may not survive, but that's okay. I wasn't really planning on propagating this plant anyways, but while I had it out, there were just so too many corms and it would just be a waste to throw them away. So just like, I can only be and see it amongst the substrate, but one, two, three, four, five. And then I'm just going to get some water at the bottom and I'm going to stick it in my prop box and it should be sprouting within the next few weeks. Um, if the corn was kind of too immature to begin with, it might take a couple months, but my corn propagations have pretty much all been successful. But yeah, that's alocasia propagation. It's so simple. Um, and you kind of want to do this when you unpot the plant because a lot of the corms can be like very deep down in the substrate. So you would have to dig quite deep to get to them. But alocasia roots kind of go a little bit crazy so they get root bound pretty quick. Um, they don't mind being root bound. I think that's why they grow roots so robustly and so like vigorously is because they really want to fill out the pot that they're in. But you know, every six months or so, I find that my alocasias need to be upgraded otherwise Oh my gosh, what happened? <laughs> Upgraded, otherwise they, they start to uh, shrink in size, like of new growth. They, the new, new leaves end up being a little bit smaller, so that's a really good time to fish out any corms. Um, doing it sooner than that would mean that like you're kind of you're kind of impatient to get corms and you know you need to start propagating to sell or something like that, but when you up pot your alocasias, always look for new corms and they do start to produce them at a pretty young age. So yeah, uh, that's a little bit of the video that I forgot to mention. All right, bye-bye.